In my Wednesday night Bible class, we started looking at certain characters in the Bible, characters that are not really well known by most people. Uh, we looked at Eutychus, talked about church members that fall out of church. You know how he fell out of church? If you don't, you should have been here for that lesson. Last week we talked about Demas, the biography of a backslider. Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. In the next few weeks on Wednesday night, we're going to be looking at characters in the Old Testament, especially during the time of King David. There's just a lot of interesting characters that lived during that time. To give you a taste of that, I decided to look at one of them this morning. How many of you ever heard of Abner in the Bible? All right, there's quite a few of you. Abner was a great champion of Israel. He was a military leader. He was the general of King Saul's army. And because of that, he was the enemy of David. Because Saul was trying to kill David. David had been anointed to be the next king of Israel. And uh, Saul wanted his son to be the next king. He wanted to, to keep that dynasty in his family. And so they sought David's life. And uh, finally, King Saul was killed in battle. And upon Saul's death, Abner tried his hand at king-making. He was going to make one of Saul's sons, uh, Ishbosheth, the next king of Israel. And, of course, that led to war between the forces of David and those loyal to Saul. Uh, if you look at 2 Samuel chapter 3, be our text this morning. 2 Samuel 3 verse 31. Abner is killed and we'll talk about how he is killed later, but he dies. And verse 31, David said to Joab, and to all the people that were with him, rend your clothes and gird you with sackcloth and mourn before Abner. And King David himself followed the bear and they buried Abner in Hebron. And the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner and all the people wept. And the king lamented over Abner and said, died Abner as a fool dieth? Thy hands were not bound, nor thy feet put into fetters. As a man fall before wicked men, so fell thou. And all the people wept again over him. When all the people came to cause David to eat meat while it was yet day, David swore, saying, So do God to me, and more also, if I taste bread or aught else till the sun be down. And all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them. As whatsoever the king did pleased all the people. For all the people in all Israel understood that they, it was not of the king to slay Abner, the son of Ner. The king said unto his servants, Know ye not that there is a prince and a great man fallen this day in Israel? And I am this day weak, though anointed king. And these men, the sons of Zerah, be too hard for me. The Lord shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. Verse 33 is the key. David asked, did Abner die as a fool? What did he mean by that? As he laments over the death of a man who was his enemy. But as you read the story, Abner is coming around. He's beginning to accept the fact that David's going to be the next king, and, he, and he's even telling his men that they just should consider following David and making him king. But I want you to know four things about this story of Abner and his death. If you want to take those, first we see his fearful danger. And note the cause of the danger. How did Abner die as a fool? We need to go back to chapter 2, and we read about a battle. 
in which Abner and his army is fighting the army of David. King Saul had died. Abner is trying to enthrone his son Ishbosheth. And there's a struggle between David and Ishbosheth for the throne. The battle has gone against Abner, and he flees from the battlefield. In 2 Samuel chapter 2, look at verse 17. See what happens here. There was a very sore battle that day, and Abner was beaten, and the men of Israel before the servants of David. And there were three sons of Zerai, Joab, Abishai, and Azahel. And Azahel was as light of foot as a wild roe. He was fast. And Azahel pursued after Abner, and in going he turned not to the right nor to the left following Abner. And Abner looked behind him and said, Art thou as the hell? And he said, I am. Abner said to him, Turn thee aside to thy right or to thy left. Lay thee hold of one of the young men and take thee his armor. But as hell would not turn aside from following him. And Abner said again to as the hell, Turn thee aside from following me. Wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? How then should I hold up my face to Joab thy brother? How be to refuse to turn aside? Wherefore Abner, with the hind end of his spear, smote him under the fifth rib, that the spear came out behind him. And he fell down there and died in the same place. And it came to pass that as many as came to the place where Azahel fell down and died stood still. So Abner did not want to fight Azahel. But Azahel refused to stop pursuing him. So finally, Az Azahel was killed by Abner in battle. Now, Azahel is the brother of Joab, who was the general of David's army, a great man of war. So Abner is in big trouble. Joab is after him. You see, there was a law in Israel in the Old Testament that if a man was killed, his next of kin was duty-bound to avenge his death. He's called the avenger of blood. And he could justifiably take the life of the killer. The law says what? An eye for an eye, a life for a life. So legally, he could do that. So now Joab and Abishai are pursuing after Abner to kill him for killing their brother as a hell. So Abner's in danger. Joab is after him. Now, Abner's able to escape from them at that time. And we read that Joab ceases from pursuing Abner, but he's not forgotten about this. He's just waiting for the right opportunity to avenge the blood of his little brother. So how do we apply this story today? Well, think secondly about the call of danger. The call of danger. Just as Abner is fleeing from the vengeance of Joab and from his judgment, the lost of this world are in danger of suffering the wrath of God. The lost are the enemy of God through unbelief. They have rejected God's anointed king, the Lord Jesus Christ. They've not come over to the Lord's side. So in the story, Abner pictures the lost person who's running from God, running from judgment. Death is pursuing him. King David pictures the Lord Jesus Christ. As David was the anointed of God, so is the Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed of God. Joab pictures the devil who is going to deceive and trick Abner in causing his death. So think of it that way. The lost are under condemnation. Judgment is coming. Now listen, if you're not saved, you are in great danger. You're in great danger. If you die in your sins without God's forgiveness, 
My friend, you will be damned to an eternity of torment. You're in great danger. We want to point you to the refuge in Jesus Christ. Like John the Baptist did in his generation. You might jot this verse down, Matthew 3, 7. John said, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? The wrath to come. He's talking about the wrath of God. That is coming upon an unbelieving world. The Bible says in Romans 12, 19, God says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. The wrath of God. God is angry. God is angry at those who have rejected his only begotten son who died on the cross to save them from hell. Lost friends, you're in danger. You're in more danger than Abner was. Abner was just running from a man. You're running from God. Amen? You're fleeing the terrible wrath of God. The Bible says, Hebrews 10, 31, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a fearful thing. To stand before God lost, sins unforgiven, without a Savior. God does not want to pour out his wrath upon you. Did you know that? It's not God's will that any perish. But that all come to repentance. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved, to come into the knowledge of the truth. All men. It's not God's will that anybody should ever perish and die without Christ. But if you're lost, you are in danger. But my friend, God has provided a way of salvation for you. You don't have to die like Abner died. So second, notice his foolish death. Why Abner ultimately died foolishly. Why did David say what he said about Abner? That he died as a fool. Well, Abner's in Hebron when Joab comes. In chapter 3, verse 27, Abner was returned to Hebron. Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him quietly and smote him there under the fifth rib, and he died for the blood of Azahel, his brother. Joab kills Abner. Now what's wrong with this picture? This happens in Hebron. Do you know the significance of Hebron? Go to, go to Joshua chapter 20 with me. Let me show you something. In Joshua chapter 20, when the Israelites settled in the promised land, God set aside six cities to be special cities. Cities of refuge. Look at Joshua chapter 20, verse 1. The Lord also spoke unto Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint out for you cities of refuge, whereof I spake unto you by the hand of Moses, that the slayer that kills any person unawares and unwittingly, or you might say accidentally and unintentionally, he may flee thither to one of these cities. And they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. And he named six cities that were set aside to be cities of refuge. Verse 7, they appointed Kedesh in Galilee and Mount Naphtali, and Shechem and Mount Ephraim, and Kirjath Arba, which is Hebron, in the mountain of Judah. So Hebron is a city of refuge. That's why Abner's there. Abner is safe in the city of Hebron from Joab. Joab cannot legally go in and avenge the blood of his brethren in a city of refuge. 
But Abner died as a fool because he allowed Joab to come, lead him outside the gate of the city. He's outside Hebron. And out there, Joab stabs him in the back. That's what David meant when he said, Did Abner die as a fool? There was no reason for that to have happened. That brings us to another thought. Why all unbelievers die foolishly. All who die without Christ die foolishly. They die in their sin even though there is a Savior who is available to them. All unbelievers are in great danger of the wrath of God, but God has made a refuge, a place where we can go to escape judgment. God provided the Lord Jesus Christ to be that. These cities of refuge picture Jesus. As they could flee to a city of refuge and be safe from wrath, we can flee to Jesus Christ and be safe. Go to Hebrews chapter 6. Let me show you. In the New Testament concerning this. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 17. It says, For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's chapter 7. Let me back up where I'm supposed to be. Chapter 6 verse 17. All right, this looks better. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable things, in which it's impossible for God to lie, look at this, we might have a strong consolation, we who have fled for refuge, to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters into that within the veil. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus. Made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And you know the veil was what was in the temple. It separated the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. Jesus entered into the veil, into the Holy of Holies to scatter his blood on the mercy seat as an atonement for our sins. And because of that, we now have a refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you fled for refuge in Christ? If not, I hope you'll do so today. I hope you'll do that. There, there's many people today like Abner. I mean, Abner was admired. Abner was respected in the world. Yet, there are people like that. They die. I just think about the, the justice court uh, judge recently she died and man there's just a lot of uh, testimonies and things about her what a great person she was I don't agree with it she had a lot of blood on her hands but they make a big fuss over somebody like that but those people if they die without Christ they die as fools because they don't have to die that way they don't have to die Lost in their sin. Salvation has been provided. They die foolishly. Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is what? Saved. If you know that Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, my friend, you're saved. You are saved. Jesus is our place of refuge. Jesus is our ark of safety. And in him we're safe from the wrath of God. See, the wrath of God fell upon Jesus when he died on the cross. He suffered the wrath of God in our place. So by trusting in him, the wrath of God has already been quenched upon him at Calvary and we are safe from that. Safe from judgment. But we should weep as David did. 
as David wept for Abner, when we see our relatives, we see friends that are lost without Christ and they're facing the prospect of dying that way, we should weep for them. We should warn them of the wrath to come. We should tell them of that place of refuge. Tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ that they might be saved. Just don't wait until after they're dead to weep for them. We should weep now with compassion. Thirdly, what you see is fiendish deception. Consider the man Abner and how he's deceived. Why did Abner leave Hebron? Why did he walk outside the gate of safety? He was deceived. He was deceived. Joab deceived Abner into thinking that everything was okay between them. See, Joab shows up at Hebron one day. He's at the gate, and he sends word for Abner to come and talk with him. Abner comes down, and they're inside the gate. He's safe. And I, I suppose Joab might have said something like, well, you know, Abner, I realized my brother's death was on the battlefield, and you had no choice but to defend yourself. I've come to accept that. And why don't we, why don't we just take a walk and talk about the future? how we can serve King David together. So Abner takes a little walk with Joab. Joab leads him outside the gate. And on the outside, he pulls out a dagger and stabs him in the back. That's why he died foolishly. Right outside the gate of a city of refuge. He was deceived. Look at chapter 3, verse 33 again. I want you to see this. And the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner as a fool died? Look at verse 34. This explains what he's talking about. He said, Of Abner thy hands were not bound, nor thy feet put into fetters. As a man falls before wicked men, so fell thou. The wicked man was Joab. He's saying Abner was not tied up and bound and, and carried outside of Hebron. He walked out in his own will. He was deceived by Joab. He allowed himself to be tricked. Well, consider, secondly, the master deceiver. Why, why do people reject Jesus Christ and die lost? Many of them because they're deceived. They're deceived by the wicked one, the devil. See, what he does, he convinces some of these people that he's their friend. And God is their enemy. He has them believing that God is just trying to ruin all their fun. You ever talk to people like that? God's just a killjoy. He doesn't want us to have any fun. And people are deceived. And the thing, if they ever get saved, become a Christian, they have to live in misery for the rest of their lives. Maybe they think that from observing some church members who are so joyless, always complaining and murmuring. Maybe that's where they get that idea. I'm glad we don't have any of those here. Amen. You can say amen. We're all content and joyful, aren't we? Amen. But Satan's a master deceiver. Always has been. Did he not deceive Mother Eve in the Garden of Eden? He said to her, Thou shalt not surely die. God said if you ate the forbidden fruit, you would die. He said, No, you won't die. Listen to what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. He said, if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, who is that? 
That's Satan. Satan's the God of this world. He's blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine in them. They've been deceived, they've been blinded by the deception of Satan. Satan's deceitfulness, I think, is going to be at its greatest in the end times. Are we the last generation? I think we are. And I believe the Bible says that in the last generation, many people will be given over to a strong delusion, deceived by the devil. You see that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. It says, Because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. Actually, in the original, it's believed the lie. There's a definite article there. The lie. The lie of the devil. Now, folks, listen. If you reject the truth, the only thing left to believe in is a lie. Right? You've got to believe in something. If you refuse to believe the truth, the only thing left for you to believe is the lies of the devil. What false religion has to offer. What are you believing in today? The devil deceives many people through counterfeit gospels. Salvation by works deceives many. Salvation by religion, by rituals has deceived many. He'll do anything he can to lure people away from the Lord Jesus Christ, away from God's refuge for the soul. You know, even believers are not immune to Satan's deceit. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, 3. He said, But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. Who's he writing to? A church. He's writing to believers. He's telling them, beware lest Satan deceive you into believing false doctrine. You can be saved and be deceived into believing false doctrine. Right? We're warned about that, Ephesians 4.4. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Satan will try to, now he can't take your salvation, but still he'd like to deceive you into embracing false doctrine that will hinder and hamper your Christian walk. I think sometimes believers can die foolishly and prematurely because of unforgiven, unconfessed sin in their life. You believe that? Ananias Sapphira. Members of the church, believers, because they lied about what they had given to the church, they died. They died prematurely. Because of deceit. Now, one thing we can do, we can praise God that there's coming a day the old devil's going to be locked up. I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He's going to be successful in deceiving the whole world after the rapture. The whole world is going to bow down and worship him. John saw the end of the devil. Listen to Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 through 3. John said, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, bound him a thousand years and cast him into a bottomless pit and shut him up. And set a seal upon him, 
that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years to the millennium should be fulfilled. So it's coming a time the old deceiver is going to be locked up. And I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? He's deceiving our friends. He's deceiving our loved ones. We need to, we need to do battle against him to try to rescue them from perishing. The last thing I want you to see, I want you to see his final determination. They bury old Abner, and they weep over him. Back in our text, verse 32, they buried Abner in Hebron. And the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept. Verse 35, David refuses to eat. He's going to fast that day in mourning. Abner, a great prince of Israel. Folks, listen. All we can do when our lost friends and loved ones die is weep. We cannot win them after death. A great man had fallen. But he died as a fool, and nothing can bring him back. That's why all unbelievers who die, die foolishly. Because nothing can reverse it. You cannot pray somebody out of hell. Now, there's a religion that says that you can, but you can't. That's not in the Bible. You cannot buy their way out. You know, some will try to pay a priest money to pray their loved ones out of purgatory. You know, the problem with this is there's no such thing as purgatory. But millions and millions of dollars have been given to a false church because they claim that they can pray your loved ones out of purgatory into heaven. Not possible. My friend, the Bible says death ends all opportunities of ever being saved. Hebrews 9, 27. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after this a second chance. Doesn't say that, does it? After this, the judgment. That's all that's waiting for the person who dies without Christ. They just face the judgment of God. There's nothing we can do to help them when they die. They die without Christ. Their fate, their destiny is fixed. Nothing can change it. And it's all based upon what they did with Jesus in his life. They die without Christ, they die without hope. But think we can win them before death comes. It's too late for those who die lost. But we can help those who are still living. We can warn them to flee the coming wrath of God. We can point them to the Lord Jesus Christ as the place of refuge. We just need to do what John the Baptist did. John 1, 36. He pointed at the Lord Jesus and told the disciples, Behold the Lamb of God. There he is. We can do that, can't we? Can we point people to Jesus? Say, Behold the Lamb of God. Follow him. Now, we can't do anything for the dead, but we can do a lot to rescue the perishing before they die. It's useless to pray for the dead, but we should pray for those who are still living and have a chance to be saved. Death seals our destiny. Nothing, nothing can change that. Burning a candle is not going to help anything. See, David has no assurance he'll ever see Abner again. 
Compare that to 2 Samuel 12, 22 and 23, when his child by Bathsheba dies. Listen to what David says there. He said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. But now he's dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Now look at this. David said, I shall go to him. Where? In heaven. That's where babies go. All babies go to heaven if they die. So David says, I can go where my child is to be with him. But they cannot return to us. Isn't that, a, isn't that a blessing to know that our loved ones who also were believers in Christ, who died in Christ, we're going to see them again one day. Isn't that wonderful to think about? But let's make sure they're saved before they die. Folks, listen, don't just assume that loved one is saved. Don't, don't assume that. They might even say, yes, I'm saved. Don't be satisfied with that. Go ahead and ask some tough questions. Ask them what they are trusting in for salvation. Then you're going to find out whether or not they're truly saved. Because if they start talking about, well, you know, I, I live a good life, I do the best I can, I treat my neighbor right. If that's what they're trusting in, you better witness to them. If they're trusting in their baptism, if they're trusting in their church membership, they're probably not saved. See, the correct answer is I'm trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. So you need to ask the tough question. Hey, it's going to be holidays and some families are going to be getting together. If you've got any family members, you're not sure of their salvation, why don't you talk to them about it? Go ahead and ask some tough questions. And don't just assume. Because you might be shocked to get to heaven and find out they're not there. Then you're going to regret that you didn't ever take time to speak to them about their soul. Amen. You don't want to stand at their grave and hope they were saved. I've done a lot of funerals. And I've asked family members, was the departed, the deceased, was he a believer? Do you believe they're in heaven? I hope so. I hope so. You ever heard that, Brother Matt? I hope so. That's not good enough. You need to know. Find out. And show them how to be saved if they're not. Let's stir ourselves to warn the lost. Now we're going to have to battle the devil to do this. It's not easy. The devil is going to do everything he can to deceive them and keep them from being saved. And we're going to have to go to war. To win our loved ones to Christ. We're going to have to battle the devil for their souls. Let me say this. If you're here today and you're not saved, let me speak to you for a second. Brother Sam, y'all come ahead and get ready for the invitation. But we're going to ha have an invitation for you. We're going to be inviting you to come and enter into the place of safety, a place of refuge. We don't want you to leave here unsaved and risk dying foolishly like Abner did. See, right now, you're at the door of salvation. You, you are so close to salvation right now. Don't turn away. Don't leave here still lost, thinking you've got a lot of time to get this done. You don't know how much time you've got. This could be it. Many, many people are going to die today, November 22nd. 
They were dreaming that this is going to be their last day of life. And many of them are going to go into a Christless eternity thinking they've got plenty of time. I witnessed to a guy once, years ago. He was ready to pray with me to be saved. We were just getting ready to pray, and he stopped. He said, wait a minute. You know, I'm not sure I'm ready to do this. I don't know that I'm ready to, to make this big change in my life. And he decided to put it off. I want to get saved, but not today. Well, Satan won another great victory that day. Because he was so close. I mean, right at the door of salvation. But he refused to enter in. I never saw him again. If he dies and goes to hell, I believe he's going to remember forever just how close he was one day to getting saved. So close. You're close. If you're not saved, you're close. You're at the door today. Don't walk away. Don't spurn this invitation. The Bible says they rejoice in heaven when a soul gets saved. I wondered, did they rejoice in the devil's kingdom when you walk out of here still lost? Did they rejoice at that? Well, angels rejoice over salvation. The demons rejoice over those who reject Christ time and time again. Oh, Jesus said, John 10, 9, I am the door. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any enter in, he shall be saved, shall go in and out and find pasture. Jesus said, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Folks, there's no other way. Only one Savior has been given. We encourage you, come to Christ today. Don't let the devil deceive you into putting it off.